Oh, totally wrong screen. <laughs> hey, what's up, everyone? I'm Jay Dreamers, and uh, welcome to Truth and Movie Mondays. And I, I thought we'd break down the Princess Bride today. I did hint at it a few times in some prior videos, so I thought we'd come back and take another look at a great classic. Now, we have done a video about the fire swamp in the Princess Bride. Uh, this one's going to be more of the entire movie, basically. So grab your popcorn, grab your peanuts, if you have them, and uh, let's jump into it. This is one of my favorite movies of all time, and I really, really enjoy it. Now, the, w one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this movie in particular is because I've been talking about the Plasma Volcano so much in my Plasma Apocalypse playlist, and... I have this theory that whenever the princess is locked in a castle, that that references the blue beam in the middle of the world that shoots up from Mount Maru. You got to check out my playlist if you don't know what I'm talking about. But even if you don't know about it, you can still enjoy some of the esoteric symbolism in this movie. Let's check it out and jump right in. What's up, everybody? Mike's in the chat. Tawab, Alea, D-Nice. Good to see everybody. All right. So check this out. You might not have known this. And I talk about this a lot on my channel um, because I, I enjoy the Christmas Day catastrophe movies, as I like to call them. A lot of movies are set on or around Christmas, and uh, there's not always an explanation for it. So, for example, in this movie, <laughs> you might not have known, but this movie is actually takes place on or around Christmas. For some reason, the writers of the movie wrote it in that it would be Christmas time uh, during this movie. As you can see in the background here... There's almost like a little squatting man drawing in the background there. Now, how do we know it's Christmas time? Let's check this out real quick. And why is that important? Well, in the background, when she opens up the window, you can see that there's Christmas lights on the house back here. See those right there? And in the background, anytime that you see this kid's room, you'll see that there's a lot of Christmas decorations as well. So it's on a couple of the houses there. There's Christmas lights right there on this house. There's Christmas lights on this house in the background. And then, of course, you've got like a, a Santa Claus just hanging from his closet here. And there's some other Santa stuff in here as well. But then his grandpa comes. Now, this kid's feeling sick. He's not too good. He's under the weather. He actually started off this movie. They zoom in on him playing video games, which is a huge deal and a huge point to be made in this movie. Uh, the grandpa is going to actually make the point here in a minute. But if you look closely at this present that he gives him, he doesn't just give him a random present. Can I move that up? Oh, snap. Anyways, it's a Christmas present. So if you zoom in on this wrapping paper right here, it's kind of hard to see from this angle, but that has little Santa Clauses all over it. It's a Christmas present that he brings to him. That's why he's visiting. That's why he gives him the gift. This kid is sick on Christmas. So his grandpa gives him a book. He says, open it up. And he's like, a book? You gave me a book? This kid just finished, put down a video game. He's playing some sports video game, right? Baseball. And it's like, bump. <laughs> Super 8-bit. And uh, the grandpa brings him a book. Why? Because he's about to enlighten this kid's mind. He's about to open his mind through telling a story, which is one of the biggest themes throughout this movie, the telling and the sharing of something true, something that hits home, something that could possibly be life-changing through a story form, right? Which all of the great teachers did, you know, across religions and time. So the grandpa comes over, he's the wise old sage, and he's like, when I was your age, television was called books, right? And he's like, we need to check out a book because we, playing this sports video game, he wasn't getting anything, right? He wasn't really growing. So the grandpa brings him something of importance. They sit down and they crack open the princess bride. Now, things start off by introducing you to Wesley, who will end up being the man in black here. He starts off as a poor farm boy, now, I've found personally the best stories, especially those of adventure or fantasy, are those where the main character d starts off just not thinking that they're, you know, super special or that anything's different about them. But through circumstances that happen to them, life forces them to start growing. Hey, what's up, Joseph? Welcome to the Good Vibe Tribe. All right, so we see Wesley. We also have some one eye symbolism off the bat for the you Plasma Apocalypse fans. Uh, and researchers out there and he starts off by saying as you wish this is the core to the story as you wish equates to i love you right now the phrase i love you i want to touch on that real quick i don't i i almost can't stand hearing people say that nowadays because it doesn't hold any value there's no substance behind the words there's no action 
behind what's being said to back it up. I feel like in a perfect world, you would never have to ever tell someone that you love them. It would be evident. It would be self-evident. Um, if anything, the other person would come up to you and say, hey, I just want to let you know, I know you love me so much by the things that you do. And that's really how it should work. But our world's kind of reverse. Our world, we just, we, we lack the action, but we just say the words to convey, you know, om- it's almost like saying, hey, I'm, I'm kind of falling short on loving you. Is really kind of what it's saying, honestly. Uh, at least in my opinion. It's kind of like that song, More Than Words. I don't know if you guys have heard that one. So then we go over to Buttercup, who will be the princess here shortly. And she realizes every time she commands this farm boy around, he says, as you wish, instead of, I love you. He's saying, whatever you wish, I will, I will grant, I will do. I'm, I'm here to, to serve. I'm here to uh, put out into the world instead of take away from it. That, to me is the definition of true love. Those who add to instead of take away. Those who are constantly trying to improve and leave the world a better place. So that's what this whole movie is about. Can you believe that? The whole movie is a love story, just like every single movie I break down. Now, normally I pick out a little, you know, movies with a little more action or some clear and evident apocalyptic themes or something, and everyone just loves that. But I always, always bring it back to the love story because every single story that I pull up that I see is a love story in some way, shape or form. And that to me is the meat of it. That's the most important part of it is the love behind it, right? Otherwise, all those adventures and all that action is for nothing. So every time he says, as you wish, he means I love you. And I also like this because they equate wishing with love. I feel and I wish... That more people these days would make more wishes. That people would dive back into having a childlike mindset to see the world with greater, bigger eyes like a child would. And I feel like we would be a little happier if we did that. Hey, wait a minute. Wait, J-Dreamers, what is this? Is this a trick? Are you trying to trick me? Is this a kissing book? (laughs) Is this a kissing book? YouTube video? Is this going to get mushy? Are you going to leave out all the action and all the good stuff? No, we're totally not. But you need to keep this in mind. Without the love, without the kissing book part, okay, the crushes and, and the dying to see each other and stuff, all of that action would be pointless. You might as well play a video game because there's no love in it. You know what I mean? You have to have that love story. Is this a kissing book? <laughs> now, that's that's the other thing too. Oh, might as well. Um, kids these days are um, they're kind of grown up with video games. I mean, I grew up with video games as well, right? But it's not just video games, but the 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 YouTube videos, television commercials, everything is just cotton candy and Red Bull. That's all it is to me. I don't, I don't get any vitamins from those things. You know what I mean? That's why I like to do this series. Cause I like to, I like to pull out all of the things that I feel are nourishing to me in the movies. And then instead of just being amused by them, which is to not think and just zonk out for a while, I like to consider the deeper implications of what they mean to me in my life. And then I like to share that with all of you. So the grandpa's like, nah, 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 it's not a kissing book. There's pirates and vampires and werewolves and um, he doesn't say that (laughs) but basically he's saying it's it gets exciting so just uh stick in there stick in there right all right so he says uh wesley went on a trip he went out to sea to make a fortune because he fell in love with buttercup he wanted to take care of her i guess and he needed a bunch of money to do that was his idea, I suppose. I don't know why I couldn't just keep being the farm boy, whatever. I don't know. But anyway, and he's like, and he got murdered, moited by pirates. I can't do that guy's voice. Peter Falk. <laughs> oh, and one more thing. Just one more thing. He got murdered by pirates, right? And then the kid's like, oh, murdered by pirates is good. See, that's the exciting part, right? Let me tell you something. For everyone that's kind of like, ah, oh, life sucks, man. Why does life have to suck so bad? Why does the world have to be so crappy, etc.? Listen, I hear you. I say that a lot. But I also am balancing out in the back of my mind that we need that. And I want that, right? We need the bad to balance out the good. We need the bad so that the good 
is good, right? You have nothing else to, to compare it to, right? You got to have the hard times. You got to have the troubles. You got to have some tribulation on your path. Otherwise, your journey is kind of boring. Nobody's going to watch your story. I mean, I'm not. I'm going to watch. That's that's why it's like, man, I, I feel like, oh, life has handed me so many lemons or whatever. But it makes for a good story. It makes for a more fun life. It makes for living, actually. All right, so here's the douchebag prince. I forgot his name. What's his name? Um, prince Humperdinck. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Humperdinck. How could I forget that? <laughs> uh, let's see. Free Soul Chopin Sonata. Chopin Sonata is uh, in the chat and says, J Dreamers, I recently found your channel. You opened my eyes and make me think about a lot of things that's hidden from us. Thank you. I hope you're doing okay. Hey, thanks, Free Soul. I appreciate you. I'm doing great. And uh, I'm glad that, you know, you find something of value in, in, in my videos. All right, so the the Princess Humpadink is uh, introducing everyone. I wanted to, I took a picture of this real quick just to point out the royalty, why they wear these crowns. The crown is literally a corona or corn, which is, that's how you say it, short form, if you could take it way back a long time ago. And the word corn is actually the word horn or horn, okay? That's why they wear the corona or the horns on their head. Why? Because the ancient leaders before humankind or humanity took the spot of, you know, world rulers, essentially. Uh, there were these other beings that were in our world that came down from the skies or up out of the middle of the earth itself. And they ruled for quite some time. And they were rumored to have across the board every time, for the most part, <laughs> uh, horns. They had a crown of horns around their head, okay? Just like, you know, you see in movies where some, you know, people have actual horns sticking out of their head. And I also, and they were immortal, remember that, okay? I'll bet that if we were immortal, we would probably end up growing some horns too. I know that might throw some people off, but they do say there may be some relation mixed in there somewhere. But that's for you to decide. All right, so check this out. This dude right here um, represents royalty, okay? And in my personal opinion, when I see the princess locked in a tower or locked in a castle, to me, that represents the blue beam shooting up at the end of time during the apocalypse, okay? The blue beam is Sophia, the blue beam is the light of the world, and it gets locked in a way in a castle or a tower, which is Rupus Negra, the Black Mountain or the Magnetic Mountain, right? And he's wearing all red. The sky is blue. But they have to kind of make the sky blue, I suppose. But there's a lot of red and blue symbolism in this movie as well, from the red sky and the blue sky. I believe that the movie is actually showing us what happens when you're in the red sky. And this guy is trying his hardest to keep ownership of the blue beam or the princess herself, the one that uh, the movie's about. Now, whenever Buttercup becomes the princess and she makes her debut as the princess of the castle... She's surrounded by mist. She's surrounded by fog. Why would they have her be surrounded by mist and fog, except for to just add to the ambiance, you know what I mean? Let me get another one of those. You guys have popcorn? <laughs> anyway, um, I believe that the reason is uh, whenever the princess makes her appearance at, at the uh, Rupus Negra, the Black Mountain in the middle of the world, that's whenever the world depressurizes. And when the world depressurizes and the atmosphere depressurizes, our closed system in on the Earth will turn into temporarily an open system, right? And when that happens, all of the pressure that is in our atmosphere leaks out and the atmosphere expands, creating instant fog, mist, and sometimes snow. So we have the appearance of the princess mixed with the fog itself, but when it comes to Humperdinck, she did not love him, right? She did not love... Now, let's let's imagine that she represents the blue beam, as I've been talking about, right? right? She doesn't love royalty. She doesn't want royalty to win. The blue sky that we live under right now, the system that we live in right now, is one that is ran by the royals, the nobles, the elect, those who chose themselves, essentially, or possibly were chosen by somebody else. Um, to rule over everyone else, to be dictators, to say what happens to everyone else, to give orders, to govern, to control. But the red sky after the apocalypse is a totally different story. That evens out the playing field. 
That gives everybody a chance. That puts everyone on a fresh sheet of paper. And she, in the movie, is not rooting for the royalty to win, to take over. She wants the average person to have a fighting chance, which is her farm boy. Now, I love this part, right? We are but poor, lost circus performers. Is there a village nearby? There is nothing nearby, not for miles. Then there will be no one to hear you scream. <laughs> I already know the movie. I'm sure you guys do too, right? All right, so check this out. So this is where she meets Vicini, this guy right here, little short dude. Um, Inigo, the sword fencer guy, and Andre the Giant. I mean, everybody knows he's Andre the Giant. Um, or affectionately known as Fezzik in the movie. We're going to get more into these guys right now, so let's check them out. We we meet the three wise men, we, we, could, we could call them, I suppose, even though, um, you know, we'd have to... Uh, We'll see about that. Now, check this out. Out of out of these three right here, this guy right here is really the only one with like real selfish, murderous intentions. We're going to take a good look at this relationship real quick because these two, although they're bad guys and introduced as bad guys, I mean, they're kidnappers and stuff, right? Um, they're basically kind of like hired henchmen or whatever. But this guy had an amazing backstory, an amazing life. All of them did, really. Okay, because this movie is just like the, the super short version of the book. The book gives you way more backstory and detail on all of these people. And by the way, who is this movie about? Is it about the princess? Standing for Truth is in the chat and says, Every time I hear you mention the depressurizing event, I think Mel Brooks's Spaceballs. That's a really good one to... F I should do that one too, actually, because you're totally right. When they when they bust out the vacuum suck, you're totally right. It's exactly what that's showing. Also in um, uh, Total Recall, same concept too. Anyway, so these guys just work for Vicini. Vicini's the brains. He's the ones that's giving the orders. He's the alpha. He's the loud mouth, right? But these two right here tell you who they are and what they're about off the start. Uh, Fezzik is like... I just don't think it's right killing an innocent girl. Or however he talks. I'm going to do all the impressions today. I don't care. Um, he sounds like he's swallowing his own throat. So that's what I try to do whenever I try to do my Fezzik impress impression. All right. Uh, let's see here. So then we've got Inigo. Inigo says, I agree with Fezzik. And then he's like, oh, the sod has spoken or whatever. So then he starts insulting them, right? Now listen, this is what's going on. Now compare this to you in your slave job that you probably have out there, most of you, right? This is your boss, okay? This is most of our bosses for most of our lives, okay? If you speak up against what their program is, or you try to add some ideas and be like, hey, you know, here's a, here's a better idea or here's a suggestion, right? I just don't think it's right killing an innocent girl. And then he's like, because he's saying, hey, uh, I don't think we should kill this girl. You know, like, well, what's going on here? You didn't say anything about killing anybody. And this guy's like, I totally agree. Now, remember, this is the working class. Just by speaking out, right, which is good, which is what they should have done. They should have spoke out, right? But then... The problem is they get yelled at. They get reprimanded, right? When I found you, you were so slobbering drunk, you couldn't buy brandy, right? So now he starts insulting him. He's like, without me, without some sort of a purpose in your life, which he's saying that he is the purpose, okay? Which is not true, which is your bosses at work have probably done that from time to time here and there as well, implying you need this job. You need me because I can fire you, because I can make you homeless, because I can make you afraid of losing your food and your water and your clothing and your shelter and all of these things. They start, they start yelling at people and insulting them and putting fear into them. This is our modern corporations talking, in my opinion. And then he says, And you friendless, brainless, helpless, hopeless. Do you want me to send you back where you were? Unemployed in Greenland? <laughs> I'm doing it all the way. <laughs> anyway, uh, so same thing. He just threatens to fire this dude, right? Uh, the unemployed giant, which, by the way, isn't that super interesting that they made Andre the Giant from Greenland, which is 
rumored to be the place where actual giants come from and or live, right? Now, personally, I don't think they actually come from Greenland originally. I believe that they come from inside of the earth and make their way out towards like um, what may be a land bridge or the closest land from the land at the middle at the North Pole, which is rumored to be there on ancient maps and um, in our known world, I'll say. Right. So I think that that's one of the reasons why Greenland is all blurry and white on Google Earth and maps and stuff like they don't put any detail whatsoever. You know what I mean? And it's not just because it's oh, it's covered in snow. I doubt it. Okay, I really doubt the entire continent or whatever it is is covered all in snow 100%. So you just have to blur it all out. Anyways, let's move on. So then these two start rhyming. They start they start playing. They start having fun. They're making the best of a bad situation. They're like, our job sucks. Let's have a good time. Let's make the most of it. And that is one of the reasons why I like Fezig and Inigo, right? They have good hearts deep inside, right? They're just... They don't know what to do. They don't know how to escape their bad situation. They're stuck in a loop, which is this slave job that they have because they need money to buy food and pay bills, etc. Right? So they're making the best of it. So he says, probably he means no harm. <laughs> and Fezig comes right back. He's very, very short on charm. Right? Or something like that. <clears throat> so, check this out. Why is this also important to me, esoterically speaking? Because going back as far as we can remember, we start to forget. We started to forget history. History itself, as the truth of our past, breaks off and fragments over time and becomes a huge telephone game, right? So, one of the ways and tools that we have implemented in order to help us to remember our way back home and to remember... Um, you know, our older stories and lessons and stuff is through rhyming. That's one of the main ways that we can remember important information is to lock it in in a rhyme scheme, which helps us because it gives a little tool in the brain. It helps us to remember things easier. So some of the most important lessons were taught through song and often rhyme. Uh, it's even rumored that Ancient Hebrews used to sing the entire Old Testament, like, or at least, you know, I don't know if it was just the Tanakh or the Torah or what, but they used to sing it, actually. And many other cultures and religions followed suit and did the same thing, you know. So anyways, uh, they're rhyming. They're starting to rhyme. And Vizzini's like, no more rhymes now. I mean it. And <laughs> Fezzik, right on key, says, anybody want a peanut? <laughs> <clears throat> Can't do the Fezzik voice too much. I might swallow my tongue or something. All right. So then they move on. They kidnap the princess. They're taking her away, right? Uh, remember, why Why is the princess a big deal esoterically? Because the princess, okay, forget the actual princess. I'm, I actually don't like the princess in this movie. I'm going to be honest, okay? Like, she's not, she would not be my type. Like, she just, <laughs> I feel bad for the man in black, essentially. But anyway. Um, the reason she's important is because esoterically the princess is the protector. She is the one that, um, and I'm talking about like the blue beam. Okay. The blue beam is known as Sophia or the princess or whatever. Um, but that blue beam provides health and life to the world and aids in the growing of crops and food and so many other things. Right. So it's very important that that blue beam or that eternal flame stay eternal and stay lit so that our world can prosper because the moment that blue beam retracts and goes back within the earth or into the, the hollow parts of the earth, that's whenever the surface world where we live starts to sort of fall apart. Famine hits, deserts arise, things start to crumble, you know, the magic starts to dissipate from our world, etc. So he looks back, he's like, are you sure nobody's following us? That would be inconceivable, he says. Now, I, I'm going to talk about this because there's actually something behind it. This guy, like I said, represents the ruling class or at least uh, the bosses in our slave jobs and stuff like that, right? He He's like corporate America, you know, you could say that. He's like a corporation leader or something, right? Now, he represents mainstream thought. Mainstream thought across the world basically says, if I don't know about it, it's a lie, if I don't understand it, it's a lie. If, if, 
if uh, if I don't think it's possible, it's not. You know what I mean? Like that to me has been my experience with mainstream, um, um, the the mainstream world essentially, right? Where the people on, who are in charge, the people on top, they're the ones that say how it is. They're the ones that lay out the definitions and tell us the truth, and then we just go around regurgitating it all over one another like pigs. <clears throat> Uh, so he, that's why he says inconceivable. Now check this out. This dude's literally sitting there looking at the boat right behind him, asks his boss, are you sure no one's following us? Cause you said no one's following us and then nobody could. He's like, it would be inconceivable, which means in his mind, there's not a boat back there. Even though this dude right here clearly is looking at one, right? So he says it would be absolutely, totally in all other ways, inconceivable. Right. He's just like, no, no, there's no way, no possible way. Now, imagine this is the mainstream world and you try to talk to them about some fringe topics, right, that are a little bit outside of the norm. This is the normal response that we get from the rest of the world. The rest of the world's like inconceivable. I don't see that happening. <laughs> right. But clearly there was somebody right behind them. So while they're looking, the princess jumps off the boat into the water. Vizzini <laughs> Vizzini says, do you know what that sound is, Highness? Those are the shrieking eels. They always grow louder when they're about to feed on human flesh. Right? And then the eels are all shrieking around them. I can't do the eel sound. That just, that's not what they sound like. They don't sound like they're breathing on her. But anyways, <laughs> the middle henchman is uh, Inigo Montoya, just so you know. Okay, so now the shrieking eels. Let's talk about that. Why is this in the movie? Did you know that in the book they don't have shrieking eels? They totally adapted that only for the movie. Interesting. In the book, it's sharks. In the movie, it's shrieking eels. Now, is there such thing as sharks? Yes. Is there such thing as shrieking eels? I'm not too sure. I never heard about him, right? So this is actually really interesting. I'm going to do a topic video tomorrow about... Are you ready for this? I'm going to give you guys a little preview because I'm really excited about this, this video we're doing tomorrow. But it's going to be about Siren Head, The Sirens, and Banshees. Now, the Shrieking Eels fall right into that category. So tomorrow, I'm probably going to reference the Shrieking Eels as well. But I'll give you a hint. They represent electromagnetic activity in the form of plasma streaking by. And they make that sound. All right. Anyway, so she jumps into the water. Then they reach the cliffs of insanity. Ah! <laughs> I feel like he should just laugh like a crazy lunatic at that point. He might have. I don't know. But anyways, so on their journey to wherever they're going. And I'm going to throw this out there before I forget. Because I might forget. I'm not sure. Um, but there was a sequel that was in the works to this movie or to this book, I should say, called Buttercup's Baby. And check this out. The main point of the sequel, even though the sequel was unfinished and, and never really uh, never really completed, the main point was that the, the main characters in this movie, except for Fezzik, because Fezzik dies. I'm so sorry. He jumps off a cliff and tries to rescue a baby, uh, which is something Fezzik would do, right? Uh, but the main point of the sequel is they're trying to get to some safe zone. They're trying to escape from all of the people who are hunting them. They're trying to go to this place called One Tree Island. One Tree Island. Interesting, right? Anyways, we get to the Cliffs of Insanity. Now, in my opinion, the movies are often quite showing us, uh, or quite often showing us, a literal, actual map Whenever a character is trying to like get to some sort of place of safety or something, I feel like the movies speak to me and say, here are the things you can expect on your journey, that there's some sort of grander, higher journey, right? I'm not, I, I understand, believe me. I know there's a lot of people that internalize a lot of the external things that I talk about, and I love that. You should, right? Because that should be the most important thing. But we live in a fractal world or a fractal verse, right? So in a fractal verse, the internal is the exact same as the external. So here's the, here's the key. Certain teachers across time will teach externally so that you can apply it internally, right? That's the reason that I do that. 
All right, so the Cliffs of Insanity. <laughs> All right, so check this out. He looks up at the Cliffs of Insanity. This is a part of their path. And because they're showing it to you, they're also saying this might be a part of your path. So it's up to you to figure out what the Cliffs of Insanity are to you. To me, this represents climbing the plasma volcano, essentially. That's that's what it, that's what it is to me. Um, Maui had to do it. Moana had to do it <laughs> like they basically climbing the cliffs of insanity. All right, let's move on. So they're going up there and check this out. They're not doing his worker bees are not doing a good job again. And he's like, he's gaining on us. And he's like, whoa, I'm carrying only three people and he's got only himself or whatever. <laughs> right. He's like, dude, I'm trying my hard. I'm literally carrying you. Right, boss? You're doing zero work and you're yelling at me carrying you and other people for you. And you're yelling at me, right? And he says, I do not accept excuses. I'm just going to have to find myself a new giant. That's all. And he's like, don't say that, Bissini. So he threatens his job again, right? Imagine that. People, oh, see, here's the thing. Inigo... And uh, Inigo and Fezig have not claimed their power. They have not claimed and recognized their value. They have value. Each one of us brings something of value to the table of the world. I don't care who you are. Every single person out there has some area that is your area of expertise, something you're good at, something of value you could offer to other people so that you don't have to go be a slave to somebody else. But these two have not realized their value quite yet. They have to go through some trials and some tribulations in order to do that. So they look over the edge. He didn't fall? Inconceivable. Now, check this out. I love this. He calls him out again. See, this is how you could tell that these two are like truth seekers starting to break free of their conditioning, their mental conditioning, because they're starting to question their bosses and they're starting to sort of uh, speak out and speak up. And I like that about them. So he says, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means, right? So he calls him out and says, hey, man, you're turning a word into something else. That's not what that word means. This is also something that the corporate world has done. We've become so politically correct. We've changed literal words from meaning one thing into meaning almost the opposite of whatever it means. But basically, in the corporation of various governments around the world, their word is law. Their word is the dictionary. Their word is whatever they say that it is, and that's how they work. Well, whoever he is, he's obviously seen us with the princess and must therefore die, right? That's basically, that's basically the same exact entities that I was just talking about. That's their mindset when they get caught, okay? That's their mindset when somebody knows the truth that, that, that they're keeping, they must therefore die, right? Or they must therefore have a smear campaign or they must therefore uh, be insulted and you know what I mean? Like all that kind of stuff. That's, that's, that's almost always their, their retaliation. But to kill somebody is just the easiest thing for them. All right, so this guy who has studied his entire life, has amazing backstory, right? Where he's dedicated himself. He wasn't always just some some drunk guy. That's, that's kind of how they portray him in the movie. They're just some slobbering drunk or whatever. The thing is, he's got internal issues, man. That's why he's getting drunk. He's got, he's got, his dad was murdered right in front of him as a child. You know what I mean? Spent his life studying sword fighting and stuff. He's learned a lot. In the book, it goes into such extreme detail on all of the different sword fighting techniques and stuff um, that Inigo Montoya has learned, okay? So this guy is anything but some average worker be dullard with, you know, some simpleton or something like that. This guy's incredibly talented and he's kind of bored. So he says, I'm going to duel him left-handed. Now, why is that important? Because He's best right-handed, but when you do things your best that, that, that you're already good at, it's not really a challenge. It's not really fun, right? It's not exciting. It doesn't add any flavor to the blandness of the soup of life. So he decides to spice things up. I like that about him. So he says, I'm going to do him left-handed. What he's saying is I'm going to bring balance to myself. I'm going to decide 
to do something differently. Instead of doing it the way I always do it, I'm going to do it a different way and bring balance to myself. I've actually, I teach this to my son um, that whenever he's doing things, like he was helping me make breakfast one time and he was stirring the eggs. And I noticed he was using his right hand, stirring them in one direction. And so I offered for him to switch hands to use the left hand and to stir in different directions. That way he can start activating the left and the right side of the brain, right? So that we can be more balanced. Right now we're taught to be right hand dominant. Basically, we're conditioned to be that way. I don't believe people are just born right or left hand dominant or whatever. I believe that we are taught that way. We put the pencil into the right hand. We convince people to write from left to right, which almost forces you to use the right hand. Otherwise, you're going to like sort of smudge and, and erase everything that you write if you write with your left hand, right? Um, interesting thing about that, and then we'll move on to the next thing, but even though most of the world writes from left to right with the right hand for the most for the most part it didn't always used to be that way most of the world actually a long time ago used to write from right to left and with their left hand now if you write with your left hand you're more right right brain inclined okay that means you have a stronger right brain side the right brain is in charge of your creativity your wonder your childlike wonder that you have at the world, uh, being able to recreate things, you're playing, you know, like all those types of things. The left brain is more analytical. It's more focused on numbers and the ends justifying the means and making sense out of things, right? The right brain is more wonder and what if and curiosity and stuff like that. The left brain is more like, I have the answer. It's got to be this. You know what I mean? So he decides to be balanced. He says, it's the only way I can be satisfied. The only way we can be satisfied is by being balanced. That's the uh, lesson to learn there. All right, so he ends up whooping him. Or no, I'm, I'm no, they haven't started sword fighting yet. So, all right, Fezzik comes up and he says, You be careful. People in masks cannot be trusted. Think about that. I'm going to say it in my regular voice. You be careful. People in masks cannot be trusted. Now that's the movie. I didn't say that. That's the movie said that. I don't like I don't know if you wanna if you wanna apply that to something else that's you know more modern, that's up to you. But I'm just saying you don't see me on YouTube with the mask on my face. Alright, so he says, uh Oh, he's talking to the man in black, he helps him up, right? And he says, You don't happen to have six fingers on your right hand. My father was slaughtered by a six fingered man. Now, why is this important, right? Well, for one, the ancient, a certain race of ancient giants, we'll say, um, typically redheads, were known to have had six digits on their toes and their hands, okay? The legend has it that the great Anunnaki of old, of Mesopotamian, Babylonian lore, um, that these beings that came down had six fingers and six toes as well, and that they were giant. Now... Because they were rumored to have six fingers, right, on each hand, we've only got five. So we break down our, our math system in increments of fives and like tens, right? But the Anunnaki did their versions of time by sixes. They counted by six. Anyways, thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, so he says, hey, do you have six fingers? Basically saying, are you my enemy? Like, do I need to kill you? And in response to let him know I'm not your enemy... What gesture does he do? I wonder if maybe that's where we got that from, right? Like, hey, what's up, man? I'm not your enemy. What's up? See, I got five I got five fingers, right? You're just saying hi, right? Just saying what's up. Hey, what's up? Five fingers over here, bro. I'm on your side. The man in black. Oh, also, I should probably say that I, I am leaning towards the man in black representing Rupus Negra. Um, so that he can be with the blue beam, which is the princess and stuff. But I'll leave that one up to you guys to think about. Black definitely represents this world. All right. So this guy, remember I said he's he's got a good heart. He just doesn't understand. He, he, he needs someone to show him the way. He needs a guide. And the man in black ends up becoming that to him. He says, you seem a decent fellow. I hate to kill you. Right? He's saying, I, I don't want to kill you. But it's my job, bro. Don't blame me. Blame my boss. You know what I mean? Like, it's not me. He told me to do it. I got to make money. That's his mindset. 
when he should have this kind of a mindset. You seem a decent fellow. I hate to die, right? That means you're, you seem really awesome. Like, you know, I would love to get to know you more. I'd like to be friends. And this guy is showing these other two a better way. The man in black is showing these other two that they can break free from this programming where they have to do what they're told or they're going to lose something in life, right? He's saying you don't have to do that. You can choose your own path. So they start this epic battle in sword fighting land in the middle of these uh, ancient ruins on the top of this huge cliffs of insanity or whatever. To me, this is kind of like Mount Olympus or something like the gods fighting on Mount Olympus or something like that. So they have this amazing sword fight goes all over the place. He's like, uh, I am not left-handed or whatever. Right. And then he, then he's like, okay, I better start using my other hand now. And this guy's like, guess what? I'm balanced too. I'm not left-handed either. Right. He just wanted to make him feel like he was doing well. And that's something that I've noticed. Like if you play sports, or this, you could apply this in other areas, but sports is the easiest analogy. If you're really good, professional level, and then you start playing amateurs and stuff, the game is not fun if you just go obliterate everyone, right? You just dunk on everyone or score all the touchdowns or hit all the home runs or whatever. It's not fun. People don't even want to play. They don't. And they're not going to get better by playing somebody that's a million times better than they are, unless they play them a million times, maybe, right? So instead, what, te- what tends to happen by a good leader, somebody that leads by example, is they will lower themselves down and drop down to meet others on their level and then raise it up just a half a notch, just a little bit so that they have to follow to keep playing. Does that make sense? So he ends up beating him and he says, kill me quickly. And he says, I would rather destroy a stained glass window instead of... Uh, you know, killing an artist like yourself. And then he's like, however, I can't help you following me either. So boom, and he knocks him out, right? So he puts him to sleep. Rupus Negra, the man in black, however you want to look at him, puts to sleep his first victim, does not kill him, but just instead has him take a little nap. He knocks him out. Now, uh, the reason that that's relevant is because I talk about that during the plasma apocalypse where during the end of the world, there are various circumstances that aid in others, many people just passing out. Okay. Whether they pass out from sheer fright or shock or surprise, or if it's the nitrous oxide influx in a, in a gas cloud that passes them by, there's all kinds of different ways. But, um, my research indicates that people, there'll be a lot of people who pass out. Now he says, please understand. I hold you in the highest respect. This kid who is listening to this story is learning so much right now, especially since he, um, who is it? Ben Savage? Is that his name? Not Ben. Something Savage. I forgot his name. Anyways, um, he's, he loves sports. He's like, does it have sports? You know, he's got sports in his room. He's playing a sports video game. I'm glad his grandfather is reading him this book because these people are basically fighting one another, their opponents playing in some sport, which is fencing, right? And then he doesn't do some dance, some celebration dance, you know, rubbing it in his face after he knocks him out. He doesn't spit on him. He doesn't talk trash to him. He says, please understand, I hold you in the highest regard. That is the way it's supposed to be. Hey, I just got a peanut. (laughs) Welcome, Justin. Thanks for the peanut. (coughs) Excuse me. All right, let's move on. So anyways, that's the way it's supposed to be. So, He says, inconceivable, give her to me. And he takes him and then he says, now you take care of him. He's talking to the giant, do it your way. And he's like, what's my way, right? He's like, smash him with the rock, basically. Okay, I'm just going to paraphrase for the sake of time. He says, my way is not very sportsmanlike or whatever. So he smashes a rock right next to the man in black. He's like, I did that on purpose. I don't have to miss. And he says, well, how do you want to fight? You know, like, because I've got a sword, you've got a rock. What do you want to do? Right? Now, this is the point at which Andre the Giant could have broken free from his programming, or Fezzik could have broken free from his programming and, and thought, you know what? This isn't worth it, man. No matter how much money I get paid, like, I'm, I'm being asked to kill some random guy. I don't even know what's going on. Right? So he doesn't kill him. He decides not to. Just like the other guy, um, uh, Fe- uh, not Fezzik, uh, Inigo Montoya. 
He could have killed the man in black. The man in black was literally hanging onto the edge of a cliff. He could have just dropped a boulder on him or a rock or, you know what I mean? All kinds of stuff. But he didn't because they have good hearts. They don't want to kill. They don't want to murder. It's not in them. But they're told to under the threat of losing their job, essentially, right? So he says, we should fight sportsmen like no tricks, no weapons, skill against skill alone, right? And he's like, and we'll try to kill each other like civilized people, right? He's trying to make a point right now, right? He's like, that's equally stupid, right? Basically, like, why would I put down my sword? You put down your rock and we still try to kill each other. It's it's not civilized whatsoever. The civil thing to do, the loving thing to do, the enlightened thing to do would be to put down the weapons and to help one another like they end up doing anyway, right? Right To make friends, to build and increase your family instead of decreasing the, the world's population based on your own preference. So anyways, he knocks him out. He puts him into unconscious mode, sending him off into giant dreamland where he rests well and dreams of large women. Now he gets to the, uh, the genius of the group, Vicini. Now Vicini's, Vizzini... Is it Vizzini? Yeah, Vizzini. Sometimes he says things that I'm impressed by, like in a minute. Sometimes not so impressed, right? He says, it is down to you and it is down to me. And you're no match for my brains. And he's like, really? You're that smart? And he says, have you heard of Plato? Aristotle? Socrates? Morons. Ah, now see, this is where, this is where I'm like, okay, the movie's, movie's putting something in there, right? Now, are they saying that that's how smart he is? Vizzini's that smart? I don't think so. I think the movie's actually just saying uh, Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates are morons. <laughs> not that Vizzini is uh, super smart because he's obviously not, right? So he, bat he challenges him to a battle of wits. And this is another good lesson for us. I teach this to my son all the time too. You don't have to be the most skilled to win. You don't have to be the strongest to win. Oftentimes, all you need to make the right decisions to come out on top is your wits about you, right? Oftentimes, your words are going to do 10 times more than what your muscles could ever do. And I'm sure it's more than 10 times. It's probably thousands of times. So the man in black knows this, sees that he doesn't have to get all sweaty and tired getting into another fight. He pours the wine and serves him up. He basically puts um, poison into both goblets, right? And he's like, now you choose, right? Um, one of us will be dead and the other one will not be. And this guy couldn't figure it out because you know why? He thought that the only choice was that he put one, one, one poison into one goblet instead of no poison in either goblet or poison in both goblets, right? Remember, if he can't conceive of it, it's inconceivable. It's impossible. It could not happen. And he's been saying that throughout this movie. Perhaps the man in black overheard him on one of his thousands of occasions of saying that and used it against him, that he couldn't conceive of another option, another possibility to think outside of the box. So he starts rambling. He's like, uh, <laughs> he's like, Iocane powder comes from Australia and in, Australia is entirely peopled with criminals. So time out. I want to take a picture of that, right? Oh yeah, Fred Savage. Thank you. I want to take a picture of this because I've also heard this rumor that Australia is just full of criminals, right? People literally still believe that to this day. So I did some research. Now, it turns out that the, that the official story, which is still pretty suspicious to me, and I'll tell you why, is that up in the UK area, okay, um, I wish I had a map to show you guys, okay? But imagine, like, this is the world map in front of us. The UK is sort of in the middle towards the top, okay? Uh, England and stuff, right? So th the story is that they used to take their criminals and ship them all the way to the United States. But then the American Revolution happened, and they put a stop to that. So instead, they, sh they shipped their criminals to Australia. <laughs> you have any idea how far away that is, right? And these are people who, co who committed petty crimes for the most part. OK, these Australian criminals or whatever like this. I, I feel like Australia got a really bad rap when it comes to this. And I feel like here in America, we really need to clear this up 
<clears throat> and teach the truth about it. Because otherwise, otherwise, we're just saying that Australia literally is full of criminals or people who have criminal inclinations because they're related to somebody who once was a criminal hundreds and hundreds of years ago. That's ridiculous to me that we even still think stuff like that. So the reality is, yes, the official story is maybe there was like nine to 10,000 criminals in some sort of shipment that went to a settlement colony in Australia. However, before that, remember how I said they were shipping them to the United States? There was like 100,000, somewhere around there, criminals shipped to the United States. So before you start going off and judging Australia in the back of your mind, because somebody told you when you were a kid that it was populated by criminals a long time ago, I'd like you to rethink that and apply that to the U.S. of A. <clears throat> Tenfold. All right. So he's trying to explain to him all this stuff that doesn't even make sense. And he's like, truly, you have a dizzying intellect, which means you're not making any sense to me whatsoever. Right. And then he says, OK, OK, what in the world can that be? And he distracts him. Now, this is also what the powers that be above us. They use this tool as a part of their arsenal. Distraction. They just say, hey, look over there. Meanwhile, they do something over here. Right. And then you come back and they're like, what, what? Oh, uh, you know, never mind. It must have been something else. Never mind. Never mind. Uh, on to this puppy in the news. On to other news. Look at this puppy we found. You know what I mean? They, they kind of do that a lot. He said, I swear I could have saw something. No matter. And so they drink from their goblets. This guy right here just starts busting up laughing and keels over and dies. Now, the reason I took a picture of this is because I also believe, like I said, that during the apocalypse, um, when our world is depressurized, it creates all kinds of chemical soup up in the air as um, element slams into other elements and creates new elements during this uh, creation period or destruction period, however you'd like to see it. I see it more as a creation period, but I believe that there will be pockets of various types of gases, including nitrous oxide as a byproduct. Um, what does that mean? That means that it's the laughing plague. People that literally just die laughing or pass out from laughing so much, right? It's shown in a lot of different places, this concept of like something like just dying by laughing. It's in Roger Rabbit. It's in Monty Python. It's in all kinds of things. And it's clearly in The Princess Bride as well. So the man in black grabs Buttercup. They take off. I had to stop and take a picture of this because you see this boulder right here? That's a nice boulder, <laughs> but where in the hell did that come from? You know what I mean? I can't, I can't, I'm not going to put it into my head, you know, because typically what we're told is like, uh, ancient people moved the rocks from location to location. That's why there's strange boulders. Like what about all these other ones that are clearly sank down into the ground all around them? Where did these come from? The earth doesn't just grow boulders. Not that, I, not that I've ever learned. It, it's, it's allegedly, and I, oh, I've got my own cosmology locally and externally, everything. Um, but rock boulders don't just grow up out of the ground like seeds or something. You know what I mean? They come from somewhere. So I'll tell, I'll share my theory with you, which is when everything gets sucked up into the sky, dirt is sucked up, people, all kinds of stuff gets sucked up in the sky during the worldwide depressurization and the neutral point during the pole shift, which creates zero gravity or a zero gravity effect. That means that all of the dirt and sand and debris and all this stuff is mixing with water and other chemicals and other things up there way up in the sky. And then that plasma comes in instantly overpowering it with electrical force, petrifying it, turning those into boulders in the sky, which usually have a sort of fluid shape as if they were floating and then frozen that shape. And then whenever that electrical field is restored, our gravitational force, however you'd like to call that, slowly returns and those brand new fresh rocks and boulders and other debris slowly land back up, down onto the ground in seemingly random places. All right, so they run, um, they start having this conversation because she doesn't know that he's Wesley yet, right? And he says, who was this love of yours? Another prince like this one? And she says, no, a farm boy, pure or poor, whatever, same thing, <laughs> ish. Um, and this is the thing, like she's rooting and they want you to root for the underdog. They want you to root for yourself. You're the farm boy or you're the farm girl. 
That's us. We're the working class. This movie's made for you. This movie does not promote royalty. This movie is not like, hey, royalty, get out there and do your best. This movie is talking to the commoners like us. Okay. And what it's trying to do is say, you're not common whatsoever. If you have that spark of life in you, if you're different, if you're a black sheep or a man in black, <laughs> So, um, she says, you mock my pain. He says, life is pain, highness. Anyone who says differently is selling something. Isn't that true too, right? The pain is the part that we need. We have to have the heartbreak. We have to have the pain. We have to go through really messed up things. We have to screw up. Eh, somebody totally just bought one of my coffee mugs. That's the first time I've ever seen that. Wow. I can't see what it says though. Oh, I made the font too small. How cool. I, I always forget that I have merch. Well, hey, that's awesome. Congratulations. Oh, my mom actually told me. Was that my mom? Mom, was that you that bought the coffee mug? Because <laughs> my mom actually had me make that this weekend. So that's cool. All right. Well, uh, enjoy your coffee. Uh, anyone who says differently is uh, selling something. Isn't that every single commercial? right? Oh, this is, this is going to change your life. This is going to make everything great. You'll no longer have any problems if you go here or spend your money here or do this or that here or there, right? Come on down. Come on down. <laughs> Anyways, let's, let's move on. So he says, uh, she's like, you killed Wesley. And he's like, you know what? I think I remember this Wesley. Silver sister just uh, left a $5 tip and says, I love your boulder theory. Come visit El Rito for the best boulder climbing. You can stay in my guest house. Oh, that's very sweet. Thank you. And thanks for the donation too. All right. Um, he simply said, please, please, I need to live. Okay. Now, this is, this is the purpose. Why live, right? What is the purpose of life? If you're just going on automatic, if you're just bumping into wall after wall until you run out of energy and fall down, that's not living. That's not life. So he says, he, I asked him what was so important for him. Why did he need to live? And he said, true love. Now, true love is the core. That's the reason. People are like, why are we here? What are we supposed to do? You're supposed to learn how to love. In case you haven't noticed, that's what this world severely lacks. So provide it. And you have a purpose all of a sudden. <laughs> I love that. I took a picture just because of the look that he gives to her, right? He's like, true love, he replied. Right? He's like, true love. Uh-huh. Yeah, see? Then she just go, go get married. Huh? Huh? <laughs> he says, uh, or did you wait a whole week out of respect for the dead? I thought that was an interesting thing to say to the, uh, the blue beam or the princess or whatever. Uh, did she wait a whole week? Because the apocalypse is... The legends say that the, the apocalypse lasts for about a week. All right. You mocked me once. Never do it again. I died that day. Why did I take a picture of that? I don't even remember. She died that day. Oh, she died that day. So if she's the blue beam, if she died that day, it means that she retracted from the world. The blue beam goes away. It dies. Or it's seen as going into some sort of a sleep or something like that. So he, she pushes him down. She's like, you can die too for all I care. And he goes, as you wish. So he's saying, I love you, basically, right? And then he says, death cannot stop true love. All it can do is delay it for a while. So for all of you people who have not found your somebody and you feel like you're into twin flames and soulmates and things like that and you get kind of sad and you feel kind of lonely, listen, be patient. It'll come your way, okay? Like I feel like those who are destined to run into each other quite often run into each other from life to life. And yes, I also believe that this implies or hints at reincarnation, right? Death cannot stop true love. You can only delay it for a little while. Take that how you like to. All right, so this is where we get to Yoda's house, a.k.a. Dagobah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is the fire swamp, which to me is the exact same place, basically. What they're doing here is they're showing us our future, okay? The world, whenever it goes into the apocalyptic state where it starts shaking up back and forth, it liquefies. It causes liquefaction and the ground becomes muddy everywhere. We literally will have like a swamp world for a short period of time. Now, the movie's showing us the swamp world and they start walking into it and they're like, this is our new home. Guess what? This could one day be your new home if the stuff hits the fan, right? And I like this guy. He's like, 
it's not that bad, right? Now, I like this because it's not technological world. There's not a Starbucks on the, you know, there's not like a fire swamp Starbucks off to the side or electricity for his alarm clock or whatever. He's looking at it with an optimistic point of view. And I believe that's one of the things that keeps them alive, right? Instead of being so pessimistic about everything, don't you think you'll probably invite pessimism into our lives if we do that? So first we have the, uh, the little pockets of gas that shoot up. Now, if we have worldwide earthquakes, it's going to release a whole bunch of gas, especially methane, up from the middle of the earth. And it's probably going to leak out for quite some time. Now, keep in mind, our world will be electromagnetically uh, charged, okay? There'll be an influx of electricity in our world, which also means that wherever you have these pockets of gas leaking up, pss, 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 it can catch fire and make this in real life, actually. All right, so they learn to avoid that because it's got a little warning. And he's talking about how he became the Dread Pirate Roberts as he takes her under the threshold of the tree. And he's like, it's just the name. Like, the name is the thing that inspires fear in people. Hold on, I'll get to that in just a second. And I believe that that's true just as much today, right? It's... we. We hear these names attached to certain royal families who all change their names to keep the name of power or to keep the name that actually drives fear into the hearts of people or whatever, as do presidents, as do car companies, as does everyone. They're all named after gods or uh, angels or demons or things of that nature, right? So they keep going. She falls right into the sand. Like I said, liquefaction, right? It creates quicksand. They call it lightning sand in the movie, but it's literally just quicksand. It's where the water rose to the surface and they can sink down in it quite easily. And she says, Wesley, what about the R.O.U.S.'s? Rodents of unusual size? I don't think they exist. Boom! Gets hit with one, right? See, this is another thing. No matter who we are, no, and Wesley was smarter than Vizzini. He was um, more skilled than Inigo, and he took down a giant, Fezzik, right? But even then, he allowed his mind to be limited, which led him to danger, right? He said, I don't think they exist. The moment that he admits that he stopped believing that something was possible, boom, it jumps right out and in his face and attacks him. Now, why is this key? Because the rodents of unusual size means gigantic, right? Gigantism is something that happens on our world after each apocalyptic reset. Whenever we have an influx of oxygen and the world is depressurized and it's full of spirit or energy or whatever you want to call it, things grow to gigantic proportions. Animals, people, plants, and they grow quickly and they live for a very long time. So right here, they're just showing you a little taste of that. So he, they end up getting caught. He's looking at uh, Tyrone Rugen, right? Count Rugen. Did you know his first name is Tyrone? That, there he is, Tyrone Rugen, right? Now, when I first heard this, I'm like, Tyrone, why, why is his name Tyrone? You know, like, come on. Like, usually black people have the name Tyrone, from my experience. I did some research. Guess what? I am now enlightened on the subject. Tyrone is not an African-American name whatsoever, belonging to almost zero black people, um, but it actually traces its roots back in uh, Gaelic language from Ireland and Scotland and that region. And I did a word search on Tyrone. It's not actually pronounced Tyrone. Okay, we have kind of messed that up over time. It's Tyr, T-Y-R. Now, Tyr is what we name Tuesday after, Tyr's Day. Um, and there was this uh, Celtic god named Tyr, which is really interesting. And so he, the, he is one who is of Tyr, essentially. Tyr on, or Tyrone, however you like to say that. Interesting stuff, right? So he looks at him and he's like, um, he's like, yes, let us get you back to your ship to safety. He's obviously lying through his teeth, right? And this guy's like, hey, man, don't lie to me. Man up. Tell the truth. You know, we are men of action. Lies do not become us, right? There's no need to lie when we can just handle things, right? You got me. I admit it. You got me. So what's going, what do you want to do now? You know, you don't have to keep lying to me about it. And he has six fingers on his hand, right? The ruling class. Boom. Six fingered man. 
So he says, you have six fingers on your right hand. Hmm, interesting. And then boom, he gets knocked out, right? He's like, uh, the first rule of Anunnaki is we do not talk about the Anunnaki, right? First, the second somebody gets some information that they could possibly spread or share with somebody else, boom, you need to go. Take them out. Take them down. Do your stuff. Do your thing. And then we come to the albino. Why is this guy in the movie? There's no need for him to even be in this movie. There's no explanation as to why he's an albino. Any of this. I mean, first of all, he's not a true albino. He should have red eyeballs or red pupils or something. You know, if he has, um, or red irises, I should say, if he's an albino. But he doesn't. So he's just a really white guy, basically, to me. Okay? I believe that they put this in here because he works deep within the earth. And those beings who live deep within the earth and the beings that live outside of the earth at times have been rumored to been to have been uh, very porcelain skinned, we'll say, right? Um, not Caucasian whatsoever. I don't have porcelain skin. Mine's more flesh toned and stuff. But I believe that that's the reason why they put him in here um, to sort of give a sort of killer clown creepy vibe to it all. Now in the book where he is now is the pit of despair. And in the book, it's really interesting because they, they go all kinds of pages deep into the pit of despair. And they talk about all these inner earth levels that exist in uh, Florin, specifically like, you know, right around where Prince Humperdinck hunts and stuff like that. And it's all sectioned off. And the lower you get, like the bigger the animals get and the more dangerous it is and stuff like that. It's really interesting. I wish they kind of put that part in the movie. And he says, nobody withstands, nobody withstands the machine. I guess he's not talking like that. Nobody withstands the machine. They're going to put him into the machine, right? What the machine means, I don't know. I hear the system whenever I hear the machine. I don't know what you guys think. And then the kid's like, that's not fair because he dies, right? They end up killing him with this machine. And he's like, and then the grandpa said, well, who said life's fair? Why does this, why does, why does this story have to cater to your desires and your personal preferences, right? This story reflects life and life is not fair, right? At least at the time, life never seems to be fair when it's not going our way. I would say that's my experience. What? What? Ah, this is terrible. Life's not fair. But then later on, we could look back and see how fair it really was. If that terrible thing had not happened to us, how would our path have been shaped? What would have happened to us instead of all of the wonderful things that we did get? Right? Who knows? Could be a good thing. Could be a bad thing. So the grandson, he goes on with the story, right? right? And it turns out, um, oh, okay. So she ends up marrying Humperdinck, but then the kid's like, oh my God, that can't be right, right? So then he's like, see, didn't I tell you she'd never marry that rotten Humperdinck? And the grandpa's like, yes, you're very smart. Shut up. I love that. It's, it's hilarious, but it's also very true. The smartest people who declare how smart they are, they're so intelligent, would benefit from just shutting up in my opinion, right? Because the, the more that they talk, the less smart they seem. When they start declaring this and declaring that, and I know this, and I'm the expert on this and that, and you need to believe me and trust in me, and I know the way, and I know the truth, probably should shut up. Just uh, some advice from, uh, from a movie. <laughs> All right, so check this out. Here's another tree portal. This is really interesting. So the... Entrance into the underworld or the inner earth in this movie is through a tree. Imagine that, right? And he says, are you coming down to the pit? They literally call it a pit. And my theory is that underneath where it is the tree of life or the trunk to the tree of life right now, which is Mount Maru, the plasma volcano. If you were to jump into that or go into that, it would go down for a very, very, very long ways. And that is the bottomless pit as described in the book of Revelation. All right. So he says, I want the thieves forest emptied before I wed. Right. He's making up all these rumors, all these rumors that everybody's believing. And um, his castle is surrounded by what's known as the thieves forest. And if you look at the old maps and read up on the North Pole and the areas around the North Pole, in the middle is Rupus Negra, the castle. Around that is said to be a magical glen or a magical forest, um, a sylvan area that's just full of huge trees, like a garden, basically, but a gigantic one. All right. 
So he says, uh, but the castle gate is guarded by 30 men. So they're they're going back to Fezig and Inigo. They're talking about how they're going to get into the castle. It's guarded by 30 men. Oh, so then she calls him out. But I wanted to point this out. She's wearing the blue, the blue beam, the princess, Sophia, and he's wearing the red, right? Which is uh, the opposite. So they're kind of like mortal enemies. Wide awake. Hey, what's up, wide awake? Good to have you join us. Thank you for the peanut. I'll take that. Oh. All right, cool. Popcorn's pretty good, too. All right, let's see what else we got. Boom. Now, this part, Inigo, right? He's like, Father, I need you to guide my sword. Guide my sword. I made him French. I don't know why. (laughs) Guide my sword, right? Now, this is a real thing that can happen, okay? People, People have taken, like, sticks and just try to walk around with their eyes closed or feeling it out, and the stick will bend down, if you know how to do it the right way, and it will, like, start bending where there's water. Right? And they divine where the water is. They can also use swords and some other things too. But in this case, his sword is going to match with the other sword, which is actually a tree. Okay? Symbolically, it's it's the sword that shoots up out of the world, the sword in the stone, etc. Right? The sword that slays the dragon. But it's metal as well. And it's going to stick to... The tree, which comes out of Rupus Negra, the magnetized volcano or volcanic rock in the middle of the world. See? He starts walking around, closing his eyes. The sword is being pulled towards this tree, which symbolically represents the middle of the world or the world tree or the tree of life, etc. And it sticks right to it. Boom. Now, they end up finding the dead body of the man in black. They take him over to this wizard dude who knows how to make like special potions and stuff. He's sort of a sorcerer. And he's like, are you the Miracle Max who worked for the king all those years? Miracle Max, M and M, M and M, 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 or if you turn it sideways, it's 33, right? So something about 33 and going inside of this central tree, right? Where's the tree? There it is. This tree, right? Miracle Max, 33 and resurrection, bringing the the dead back to life. Now check this out. Why am I saying that? Because in the middle of the world, Rupus Negra, that black mountain, is rumored throughout time to have been 33 miles in width around. Circular, okay? (laughs) Not Maybe not from one side to the other, but all the way around 33 miles, right? Interesting. Interesting connection. So he says that the king's thinking son fired me, and thank you for bringing up such a painful memory, or whatever he says. Uh, what's so important? Hey, hello there. Obviously, super Jewish, right? <laughs> like, the guys couldn't, he could not, Billy Crystal could not be more Jewish, even if he tried to pretend like one. That didn't make sense, but anyways, he's super Jewish. And he's like, What you got that's so important? What you got there that's worth living for? Now, the Dread Pirate Roberts also asked him this question while he was still alive, right? What do you have that's worth living for? What are you saying, please? True love. That's the only thing. That's what it's all about. I've got to bring true love to my dog, to my pets, to my neighbors, to the trees, to the plants. Wherever I'm going, I'm all about the true love, right? An alchemist changing everything that I touch into gold. And he goes, true love. And then the guy lies about it. We'll skip on to the next scene. So they're getting married. And he's like, marriage, marriage. That blessed arrangement, right? I just want to stop to point out this guy's garb. He's basically dressed up like the Pope. Do you see this hat? This conical, weird-looking hat right here? First of all, it's conical because the gods were alleged to be conical heads or cone heads or have elongated heads. And then it's also the fish hat. This is called the mitre. Um, It's also a fish hat, okay? They worship the fish gods, and they wore a hat that looks like a fish, which is why it has these two tails coming off of it. That's literally the fish's tail, okay? That's coming off of the fish head. You'll have to do more research on that if you'd like to. Um, You don't have to take my word for it, but check it out. Um, It's really interesting. They they worshipped Dagon, um, which was the fish god. Hey, Stephanie Campbell, been a member for two months now. Right on. Right on. It's good to see that. Good to see you uh, in the chat, Stephanie. That dream within the dream. Okay, so interesting. He says the dream within a dream. I love that they put that into the movie, not just because I'm Jay Dreamers, but this is all a story. This is all This is all a story. And you know what? You have to have something go wrong to have a good story. 
please keep that in mind. If something goes wrong in your life, odds are you're at the center of something important happening. You know, some sort of a major story, some sort of awesome movie is playing right around you. So consider yourself considered a blessing. Might make it a little easier on you. It's not like if you hate it, it's going to go away. So try embracing it sometimes. See what happens. And now this is the part where they put on the Holocaust cloak. Interesting. And uh, they start trying to scare everybody. All your worst nightmares are about to come true. Now here's the thing. That's actually true. P plasma apocalypse. Okay, putting on the glasses of the plasma apocalypse. Literally, people's nightmares are about to come true. Everybody's dreaming right now. They're just, they're not awake. They're not living. They're not anything. They need to be shocked out of it. And boy, what a shocker they probably in for, I would assume. B Brandon B Music is in the chat says, J Dreamers, it's funny you mention One Tree and One Mountain uh, when there was a TV show, One Tree Hill. The truth is absolutely in the movies and the controlling nonsense and bullshit is on network TV. Wow, that is pretty interesting. And you're totally right. right? It's just all garbage, right? They just feed us. All right. So our dreams about to come true as well as nightmares. It all depends on your perspective to some people. One person's trash is another person's treasure. One person's nightmare is another person's dream come true. It just depends on you. So finally, Inigo meets the six-fingered man. Hello! My name is Inigo Montoya. You kill my father. Prepare to die. He didn't say it with that much fervor as I just did the first time. He maybe he's a little nervous or something. So, boom. You kill my father. Prepare to die. And then, boom, you see... He finally meets him. He's ready to go. He's ready to do it. And then what does the royalty do, right? When they're confronted. Bye. I'm out. I'm out of here. No, 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 no. I have other people do the work for me. I don't fight people, right? Like if you have a problem, you need to submit a, a request. You need to put in a suggest put it in the suggestion box or something. Don't come talk to me, right? Don't tell me that I'm doing it wrong. These are the leaders of the world. So he finally he finally gets them cornered. Boom. Knocks his sword away from him. Offer me money. Yes, 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 yes. Power too. Promise me that. Anything you want. All I have and more, please. Offer me everything I ask for. Anything. I want my father back, you son of a bitch. Get some. Woo! Yes, excellent, right? So, that's the thing. I'm not going to talk about that for just a second because I, I have to I have to figure out where I was going to go with that. But basically, good for you, Inigo. Good for you, Inigo. Super proud of you. You finally did it. Now, check this out. I took a picture of Inigo here because of these knights in the background. You see that? They have these pictures like they have knights at the castle. And you would expect the castle to have knights, right? Well, where are they? They're being attacked by the Dread Pirate Roberts. There's 30 dudes outside. They're like, you want your best warriors. Where are your knights in shining armor? Well, guess what? Knights in shining armor were not used to fight in battles, primarily, to begin with. <laughs> they were dressed like that to fight monsters. They were dressed like that to survive uh, areas of powerful uh, electrical current so that they didn't get shocked. And some of these monsters might have actually had the ability to shock as a defense mechanism. So that's where the knights are. They're all fighting the Phanazoids, essentially. That's why they don't see them in this movie. They don't make that appearance. Uh, because that's they're doing their job, which is to fight monsters. They don't fight people, okay? A person could probably more easily take down a, another person if they're wearing knight's armor, is, is my guess. Because it's so bulky and it's, it's hard to move in it and stuff like that. All right. Oh, so the uh, the man in black, the only person the man in black killed technically so far is Vizzini. But it's really Vizzini that killed Vizzini, if you think about it, right? That was his choice. He didn't have to drink the wine. He could have gave up, could have gave the princess away or whatever. That was him that did that. The man in black has the opportunity to kill Humperdinck. Humperdinck, Humperdinck, Humperdinck. <laughs> it's like Candyman. <laughs> oh. <laughs> anyway. Um, he has the opportunity to kill Humperdinck. Does he? No. Of course not. He's not a killer. He's got the spirit of the blue beam, not the red beam. He doesn't want anybody to die. He's not here to take away. He's here to add to. He's here to give to the world, not take away from it. Right? 
So he he wants him to learn his lesson. He wants him to grow. That's what he wants for Humperdinck, okay? He wants him to learn a lesson, to change, to become different. So down here we've got Andre the Giant who just happens to find four white horses, right? What is the symbolism of the white horse and what riding off in the sunset on a white horse and stuff? Well, many ancient cultures talked about these holy, sacred white animals of various sorts across the realm, okay? And that they would show up, some mystical all white animal would show up, usually descending from the clouds or the sky or something, as some sort of an omen that things were about to change in the world. That the world was going to um, go through the apocalypse, basically, is what I'm saying, okay? So it's not a white horse per se, it's not a white buffalo per se, it's a phantasoid. It is an otherworldly creature that has fallen down into this world during that zero gravity shift, entering down into our world, landing perfectly fine, and these white creatures fall down from the sky. And that's what I think that's uh, symbolic of. All right, so he says, uh, the grandpa finishes reading the story to him on Christmas Eve or whenever it is, and he says, now I think you ought to go to sleep, right? Think about that. He read him a bedtime story, took him away from his video games, enlightened him, expanded his mind, hopefully helped to expand his heart and his chakras and his vibes to change his perspective so that he can grow up to use this book and these lessons that he just learned as a tool for a better life. He says, now I think you should go to sleep, right? Now, this is why I do this on my channel. I like to talk about the fantastic because I like to read people or give people a bedtime story to wake them up. Because we live in a world that's upside down. It's backwards from everything else, right? In this world, the way that things are today, you read someone a bedtime story full of all kinds of esoteric truth to put them to sleep. I would like to read you all a story and share stories with you that wake you up. So that is, I believe, the end. And then uh, Fred Savage is like, Maybe you could come over and read it again to me tomorrow, right? So instead of playing video games and stuff, he actually wants to hear the story again. There's something about the story that resonates with him, and he likes that. And he says, as you wish, right? As you wish. <laughs> that reminds me, it's kind of I kind of had an Adam Sandler, Sandler sound. Um, They had like celebrities remake this whole movie just in home movie mode. It's very addictive. It's hard to not it's hard it's hard to put that down more than the actual movie because it's really interesting how they did that. But that's beside the point. But here's the grandpa. What is he saying? He's saying, I read you this book because I care about you. I love you. As you wish. So I felt like that was a great way to end that. I hope that you all enjoyed breaking down the Princess Bride with me. Welcome Diaz Kevin 94. And I'll go ahead and run the credits and I'll say this is Jay Dreamer saying good vibes and as you wish. I'll see you guys next time. I'll try so hard to fade.